Cooking Issues. This is Dave Arnold, your host of Cooking Issues, coming to you live from the heart of Manhattan at Rockefeller Center in New York City, Newsstand Studios. Joined behind me with uh, Joe Hayes and Rocking the Panels. How you doing? I'm doing well, man. Full house. Yeah, yeah. On the other side of the studio, we got John. How you doing? Doing great, thanks. Yeah? 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 yeah. Uh, over there in Los Angeles, I think both in Los Angeles, we have uh, Nastasia the Hammer Lopez. How you doing? I'm good. How are you? Good. Good. Jack, Jackie Molecules. I'm in, I'm in Austin. Oh. Austin, Texas. Oh, uh, yeah? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, just for the mm -hmm. just for the breakfast burritos, or is there another reason you're there? I'm at the Line Hotel doing some interviews and stuff for them. Mm -hmm. And uh, very quick, very quickly before we start, I want to shout out uh, a fan of the show that I met last night. Okay, uh, he runs he runs a hot dog uh, pop up called Z's Wiener System, um, and it was very very good. Yeah. So, so what's the theory of that. operation of Z's Wiener System? What do you mean, the theory? I mean, well, like what kind of hot you know? dog? Um, I mean, John, right? You can't just bring yeah, up. No, a, yeah, you can't yeah. just say like that they're doing a hot dog thing. I need, I need deets. Like, what, like hot dog yeah, can mean sure. many things. Yeah. Well, the the one last night that he was saw uh, serving had olive salad on it, Gouda Whiz, red wine vinegar and oil, oregano. That was the special. Um, it's really good. What's the base Very hot snappy. dog? Uh, I mean, don't I fail me, thing. Jack. I'm not like a big, I'm not a big hot dog guy. I so rarely have them. But, um, okay. What technique of cooking did they use? Are they on a griddle? Griddling. Okay. Like, uh, what <laughs> colored outside or not colored outside? Blonde or like, you know, close to like Ripper? What, what are we looking at here? Well, Ripper should be fried, but you know what I'm saying? Like, what, what, what does it look like? What does it feel like? Snap or no snap? It's, it's snap. Good uh, snap. Okay. I love snap. Yeah, I, good snap. I, I do not appreciate an, a good long dog, snapless dog. dog. Seven yeah. and a half inches, all beef. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you look good. Yeah. I'm looking them up. Yeah, all right. Sounds about right. Yeah. All right. Sounds okay. about right. <laughs> right. Do, do they, uh, John? Do they call out the? Uh, do they call out the dog of choice? They do not. They do not. No. Yeah. Uh, we can get into it later. I did a. Uh, I did a Connecticut cross tasting of different uh, Connecticut Hummels versus others. Yeah. Different but good. I couldn't decide. I thought I'd yeah. have a favorite. Anyway, wait, wait. Sorry. Uh, upper upper left-hand corner, Quinn, how you doing? I am around. You're, yeah, yeah, still still with us. Yeah, yeah. Quinn had the COVID this last week. Yeah, that sucks. But uh, you're, you're, uh, you sound yeah. okay, so your lungs are, your lungs are not uh, overly affected, I hope. Yeah, I got, the, I got the, all the good drugs and, uh, they're working for now. Yeah, what's that? The Paxlovid? You rocking the Paxlovid? Yep. Yeah. Rocking yeah. the Paxlovid. Nice, nice. Wait, is it is it Paxlovid or Paxlovid? Or can you say anything you want? I don't think it matters as long as you can inhale and say the words, you know. <laughs> yeah, all right. Fair <laughs> enough. Uh, <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Uh, and today we, uh, as uh, Joe intimated, we have a full house. We have not one, but two special guests. Uh, first, of course, you know him from back in the days when he was, uh, you know, America's representative of the Ora King Salmon Corporation. But no more. He's got his own Salmon Corporation now he's going to talk about. Michael Fabro, good to have you back. Uh, great to be back. Yeah, yeah. Good to see you. No longer King Salmon, now we're talking coho. That's right. Coho. Still a Pacific species, but a different one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, we'll get into it. We'll get into it. But uh, I'm also super psyched, and we've never met before, uh, Safe Kawaja, who is the engineer that you have teamed with to do some really funky, funky, funky stuff. At the at the new place, uh, first of its kind in this country, anyway. First of its kind anywhere with exactly what you're doing, but first of its kind in this country, even I, I believe in a farm situation. A little spoiler alert: they're doing uh, ikijime on their uh, farm raised uh, salmon, and we're going to talk a lot about it in a minute. But first, uh, we're on the section of the show where we just shoot the breeze over what happened last week. So, uh, safe. I don't know you, but I noticed uh, as you walked in that you just flew in from somewhere because you lost your iPad. <laughs> so says uh, you know the airline corporation gave you a little tag instead of your iPad. I'm assuming you would prefer to have the iPad. Yeah, very much so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, where, where were you? What was going on? Did you eat anything good while you were there? Uh, I've been back and forth. We just opened up our second office in L.A. Mm -hmm. And so by, you know, kind of in between L.A. and New York right now. So really just enjoying the sunshine, the ocean. Uh, I just missed the rain. There's some pretty crazy flooding. Mm, yeah, uh, I, I would have liked that. Well, the, you know, the, the other half of the team is all on that coast, like enjoying mm -hmm. that rain. Apparently, even though Nastasia lives on a slope, is this correct, Nastasia? It still somehow floods in your house. <laughs> they went under the house and up. 
under and up. So like, water. so like there's like a rock or something under your house that like the stream is hitting and then it just shoots up, but it's not like in a pretty way, right? It's like in a trash can way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there was an earthquake on Friday. Oh or, man! Oh yeah, I was in a on the 18th floor of a building, <laughs> and the earthquake happened, and that was my second earthquake I've ever experienced. So, which one did you enjoy more? Um, well, I didn't remember the first one. I didn't um, know I had experienced one before. <laughs> the last serious earthquake I was in, I didn't feel because we were in an office tower in in Tokyo, Nastasi and I, and my wife and Dax, and I was running a vacuum machine, and somehow, you know how if you orient yourself just right with the waves, you can't feel it as much and i was just so angry i think that i didn't feel it whereas everyone else in the building was like did you feel that earthquake i was like nah did you feel it Stas? i don't remember we were together so you probably also didn't feel it i remember feeling other ones in our there was a bunch that happened like in our room we were so high that the building would like swing oh it was awful yeah i never forget one of the people we were working with had been there for a huge earthquake like a couple of years prior and you know they're all on the 40 and change floor up at the park hyatt you know up at the new york bar and uh he was like yeah when the earthquake happened like our job was to physically take the guests and walk them down the stairs hmm. i was like oh yeah so you, you know you weren't frightened he's like oh no i assumed i was dead yeah yeah, but he was like real mellow, almost like flight attendant mellow. You know what I mean? <laughs> Just doing your job. Just doing your job. It's yeah. why you can't trust professionals because they're going to give you the same demeanor regardless of what's about to happen. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's like when you see uh, when you see like a you know a, a contract killer on a on a movie and they're all calm right before they kill you because they don't want you to get excited because that causes more problems for them. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> Anywho, uh, all right. So. Uh, so that was good. Do you, but do you eat anything over there or you just did you miss the floods? Honestly, I have like a big stack of pizzas that are in our office. <laughs> mm. <laughs> don't have much time to do yeah. it. I wish it was uh, more exciting than that. Yeah, I'm going to Phoenix tomorrow, but I don't think I'm going to be, I don't think I'm going to make it into the uh, famed uh, Bianco pizza. I don't think that, I couldn't get a reservation. I don't think I'm going to make it in. Do you need a reservation? Do they have reservations? I think they do. I don't remember it being that difficult, but I was there it's a number Valentine's of years Day, ago. Though. It's Valentine's oh, Day. Oh, well, that's okay. That's a different story. Yeah. 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 Anyway, uh, who else? Who else? What do you got? Quinn, you always have something. What do you got? Uh, actually, I do have quite a bit. We made a sort of chicken and onion ragu in the style of ragu genovese, but with chicken because we just felt like it. And I also used a mixture of white wine and a little bit of uh, Chinese-style cooking wine. It's pretty good. Yeah. All right. So, like, not really Italian at all is what you're talking about. <laughs> I'm just messing well, with you, Quinn. Just, well, that doesn't matter. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, I wonder whether I did anything. I've been cooking a lot. I just can't remember whether... I can't... Actually, it's so weird. Usually, I think before I come about what, I, what I've been doing, and I can't think of it. I've been making a lot of oleosaccharums. You guys like oleosaccharums? Mm -hmm. Anyone? I Anyone? Don't know mm -hmm. what that is. So you take a peel, like citrus peel, and you, you smash it with sugar, right? And then that that abrasive power like uh, breaks up the oil vesicles, right? Okay. And then you you let it sit, and then the the moisture in the peel is managed by the sugar that's there, and it makes its own syrup, right? So it's kind of like a candied peel. No, no, you don't eat the peel. What happens uh, is it makes like a syrup and then you drain the syrup off. But all the recipes online siddly, siddly, siddly suck. They're all terrible. Uh, because, uh, let me ask you a question. Uh, why would you write a recipe that gives an amount of sugar per unit fruit? <laughs> right? Right? A grapefruit can be the size of a large orange. A grapefruit can be the size of a football. Right? Like, what, what is a grapefruit? You know what I mean? What is a lemon? You know what I'm saying? It would be different if they're like, you get your number 50 lemons and it takes this No, they don't do that. They're just like, to this many lemons. Well, what lemon do you use, you jerk? You moron? Idiot? You know what I mean? It's like, what the hell is this? And so, uh, you know, I've been doing some research and uh, it looks like peels are roughly 70, 70 to 77% moisture, right? But you can't get all of that back and then some of the sugar is lost in the... In the um, in the process, right? Because it stays, you know, it gets mashed into the peel and then there's some talk cross back, back and forth. So you can't get all the sugar in the yield back. So 
The max, assuming that you can get a, you use like a super fine sugar, let's say, and assuming that you can get a fully saturated 66% uh, syrup out of it, about the most that you can really get water-wise out, it's about 60% weight of the peel in water. So really 1.2 times the weight of the peel is the maximum you can do and still get, you know, uh, without having to add extra liquid and get a, a you know a syrup out of it, but people are like, and really one to one's better. That's what I do. But like, because I don't want a sixty six bricks. What the hell? What am I? What am I? Anyway, but the point being uh, that nobody writes that. But this many ounces to this many lemons. Oh God, come on, grow up, grow up. Anyway, call in your questions to 917-410-1507. That's 917-410-1507. If you're listening on Patreon, and John, why don't you tell them how they can listen on Patreon if they so desire. Patreon.com slash cooking issues. You guys should check out the website. There's um, three different levels of membership. You got awesome perks at all the levels, uh, discounts with partners that we work with, um, access to Discord, and just a whole bunch of other awesome things. So check it out. Patreon.com slash cooking issues. Wait, so none of you folks did any Super Bowl crap? Food? Nothing? No one? Uh, a little bit, yeah. What? Oh, oh. Uh, uh, we actually made boneless wings, like literal boneless yeah, wings. Yeah, it's a pain in the butt. Sucks. Done it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Delicious. You get that, you know, the pleasure of eating them quickly and the displeasure of having to fabricate them all. Blows. Yeah, you know I mean, did you at least pre-cook, pull, and then and then do the fry off, or did you actually try to bone those suckers out when they're raw? God, God bless you if you did. No, we did. My aunt, my dad, we bone them out raw. Sous-vide, flash fried. What a pain in the butt. You know what's a lot easier, Quinn, going forward in your life? A lot mm. easier is to make mm. uh, is to make uh, drumstick balls. Cut the drumstick balls in half. And then if you just a little like light light gluing on the drumstick balls, and uh, they they just look like be they're better wings. It's just a better wing. So the, the way you make a drumstick ball is you, uh, you take... Uh, poultry shears and you go in on the uh, I don't know what do you call this the elbow side of the of the drumstick uh, and then you just you, you go around the cartilage against the bone with your shears you go snap 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 like three or four times like like boom 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 like you're cutting around like like but, but I can't speak it visually but you can see it right you just you're going in along the bone and then rotating around like a like a like a now the now the bone is free then you Flip it around and you pull on the thing. You pull it on so that you're pulling it tight over the you know the part of the drumstick that you hold, and then snap. You cut off that that part of the bone, the you know the 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 part that the people leave on the street to kill my dog. You know what I'm talking about? You cut off that thing, and then you just rip the whole bone out from the knuckle end, and all a lot of the tendons and stuff come out. And when that thing cooks, if you're not going to do wing style, when that thing cooks, it shrinks into a ball. Hence, we call them leg balls. They're delicious. You low temp those suckers you, through and you fry them and you get these like, they're almost like arancini looking balls that are just drumstick without all that tendon. You know how much meat is wasted on the average drumstick when you give a drumstick to the average idiot? No offense, people. You're idiots at restaurants and they take two bites and they leave all that meat on the drumstick and then it's sitting there on the plate. I hate that. I understand it when it happens with turkey because the turkey is in, invariably like the meat just doesn't come off the bone. And nobody just wants to work that hard. It's like, why do they sell those dang turkey things at, at Disney, Disney X, Y, and Z? And they ne don't take the tendons out. And you see a little kid with getting poked in the eye by a tendon. And of course, they're not eating the whole turkey leg. You familiar with what I'm talking about? Yeah, Jacques Pepin uses his needle nose pliers to pull them out. Turkey tendons. I right? I've said this before on the show. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> uh, but they used to have... So, like, if you when you're butchering the turkey... Right, they used to have a machine where what it would do is, is it held the 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 drumstick end of the turkey real tight, r real tight. Then did a, a, a like a score around it, and then broke it off over a table, and you pulled the all of the tendons out through this tiny hole. But it only works if you do it when the feet are still attached, because they leave all the tendons attached to the feet, and then they just grab the feet real because it's real strong, and then all the tendons and then they extrude it through a little hole that the meat can't get extruded through along with the bone. Genius. That's what the processors used to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They, they don't Butchers. anymore? No. I mean, maybe mm -hmm. cost an extra one cent and nobody cares. People stopped caring about turkey meat. It's just a visual thing for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people, people are bad. People really, they're terrible. Uh, Michael, you said you had something interesting you cooked uh, this week? Uh, not particularly interesting. Just a, a little Super Bowl pregame meal. Mm hmm so I'm from San Francisco originally, so I had a, you know, a rooting interest in the game. I wanted to have a sit-down proper meal before the game started. So just did, uh, just my girlfriend and I, a little pan-seared steak. 
uh, some uh, some nice hot pretzels, place that we get them from in Brooklyn. Uh, some Tony Paco's pickles. Um, my girlfriend's from Toledo. Ohio? Yeah. yeah. Mm, you, know, so, you know Tony Paco's, right? No. You don't know Tony Paco's? No. Oh, my God. Uh, well, let's give me some Tony Paco's. Well, Tony, <laughs> Tony Paco's is the most famous restaurant in Toledo. Oh, well, I've never been to Toledo. Have you seen MASH? The television nah, nah, series? Nah, 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 nah. That one? Yeah. yeah Suicide's yeah. Painless? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, Klinger? Yeah, no, character yeah Klinger? No, Colonel Klinger. Colonel? No. Um, no, no. Uh, hmm. Corporal. Corporal Klinger. Corporal Klinger. Corporal right. Klinger. Yeah. Um, he was from Toledo. And I think he might have actually, in the show, he's from Toledo. I think he actually is from Toledo. Now, what's that guy's, um, what's that guy's name? Uh, what's his name? Uh, um, he hated Radar the person. The person who played Klinger hated... Jamie Farr. Jamie Farr. He hated whoever it was that played. Apparently, Radar was a real pain in the patoot as a person. <laughs> okay, I could yeah. see that. <laughs> yeah. You know, I don't know. I don't know any of these people in the real life. You know what Gary I mean? Gary Berghoff? Ah, you're a real mash of I actually yeah. didn't like the show. <laughs> what the hell is all that? What are you, just an encyclopedic knowledge of like 60s and 70s televisions? <laughs> uh, maybe it just all goes back to Toledo. I don't know. Maybe. Uh... Man, it's, a, it, uh, that's, it's an iconic show, though. I don't think people watch it, it anymore. It is. But nobody cares. Uh, they're, like, I, they're like, there was a Korean War? What? They don't even know. People don't even know. Have, and people have no memory. At least my kids don't. Uh, it's my fault there. It's my kids don't know, therefore it's my fault. Right? Right. Uh, and then so steak and then Tony Paco's is the restaurant is also a pickle. Uh, they're important. famous for their pickle. So I believe it. Well, uh, first of all, what kind of pickle? Like a real pickle or like a bread and butter pickle? No offense. See, yeah, you're going <laughs> to put me uh, on the actually, spot here. I actually like bread and butter pickles. So but. it was a, it's uh, it's sour, but also has heat. Uh -huh. uh, not much sweetness to it, All right. but maybe just in the back yeah. somewhere there's a little sweetness. All right. uh, might have been a little bit of clove in there. Uh, um, I like clove. Yeah, we're gonna um, talk about clove later. Oh uh, yeah. Um, uh, and, and I believe Tony Paco was. Hungarian immigrant or had Hungarian heritage, so it's kind of a Hungarian American restaurant. They they do they're famous for like chili and hot dogs and their pickles. Yeah, I don't know what that has to do with Hungary, but I don't know. Well, um, you know. But their pickles are good. So they for Christmas, over, cooking uh, things people want to eat. That's what people do. That's they right. Come, they come yeah, to this yeah, country yeah. and they cook things that people will buy. <laughs> that's <laughs> genius. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, awesome. All right. Um, I know what I want to talk about. Get this. This makes no sense. You ready for this? I'm going to put Nastasia on blast here. Nastasia is in California. California, theoretically a progressive state, can't gamble online in California. Did you know this? Oh, good. Did not Cannot know. gamble online in California. So I had to set up this like online thing for Nastasia where I had to pretend to be Nastasia because my physical human <laughs> flesh sack was in New York State. And like, you know... Like, they'll, oh they'll sell you anything. You could buy anything. You could buy, like, some sort of WMD. It's fine. But, like, they, if you want to bet, then, they, then like, all, all creation has to make sure that you're actually in this locale or, or the all hell breaks loose. Right, Stas? Yeah. Yes. So, yes. Nastasia cor uh, correctly. Uh, what? What do you say? We, we use DraftKings. It sounds shady when you talk about it. Like, we're, you know. It's, uh. We use DraftKings. It's my, it's my Uncle Ralph Vigorito down the street doing the bookmaking. No, actually, my <laughs> Uncle Ralph was a bookmaker, but, uh, but, the, but the point is, is that uh, he passed, actually, he died recently, Uncle Ralph. Mm. I'm almost completely out of crazy uncles. Now I'm the only crazy uncle left. How messed up is that? I mean, literally, mm. I used to, I, when I was a kid, I had so many crazy uncles, you know, Just a couple normal ones, you know what I mean? And now, gone. Ralph, Uncle Ralph was one of the last... Feel bad. Pit boss, Reno, many years. Oh, yeah. yeah. Reno, Reno. Yeah. Vice is friendly. Yeah. Then started making, uh, their company made the equipment that wrapped cigarette packages. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. Jersey. Brilliant. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, his dad, when he got out of the bookmaking business, had to get a special dispensation to come back to New Jersey to go to Uncle Ralph and my Aunt Sandy's wedding from the locals and be like, it's okay to come back even though you're retired. So they had, you know, had to go through the proper channels. Yeah, yeah, good times. What were we talking about? I don't even remember. I don't remember. Oh, betting. So betting. what happened was Nastasia. so I, I actually like appreciate this because, you know, for years, Nastasia like talks a big game about what she predicted and what she doesn't. But in the past couple of years, she's gotten in the habit, correct me if I'm wrong, Stas, of like overtly predicting things so that you can be like, 
Oh, yeah, you actually did say that, right? Right. So, yeah. so she correctly bets that San Francisco is going to be up at halftime, but that Kansas City is going to win, right? But she gets completely hosed. Tell them what happens to us. Because they went into overtime, and apparently that's not part of my bet. Yeah. So, so this is like, it's a parlay, basically. Well, she she bet halftime, full time, not halftime yeah. finish. Ah, right. ah, ah, sucks. It sucks because she would have made like a, was, a good chunk of change. Was, it was twenty five dollars to be clear. It wasn't like <laughs> it you was, know. It's more an honor <laughs> bet, but you were going to make one hundred and seventy dollars if you won. And it's bull crap. It's like it's like it's like the double zero on a roulette wheel. What the hell is this? You know what yeah. I mean? I, I heard they added another uh, another zero to the roulette wheels. Really? And, uh, Just called yeah. fu. Uh, yeah, it's like there's like a third Some zero. Them, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Which you know, this is why I don't gamble. I just does it. I can't. I can't do it. I can't do it. I mean, I gamble a lot, but just not on games of chance. You know? Has anyone been to Vegas recently? Is it true? Is there a third zero now? I've never been to Vegas ever my whole life. I was just in Vegas, and some of them, yes. It's kind of how, like, now in Vegas, all the cheap tables on the strip pay, like, six to five on blackjack instead of three to two, um, which is ridiculous. Huh. I haven't heard so, that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, man. Just making it hard on the, on the regular guy. Just you, making you, it harder, you know? I, here's, I'll tell you, the, the closest I get to casinos... Uh, I mean, they have a good mall in the casinos up in uh, in Connecticut. I've been to those, but uh, I used to get used to be able to get free ticket to Atlantic City on a bus. So you would like pay like ten dollars for the bus, right? And they would give you like fifteen dollars worth of token of uh, chips to go into the casino. So the casino would pay for these buses of people to go down to Atlantic City from the Port Authority. So we had a friend who lived in Ventnor, which is just south of Atlantic City. They live right on the beach. And so to get down to their house before we had a car, basically the casinos would pay us to go down there and we would immediately just cash the chips in and make $5 off the deal. You know, go get, go get some taffy or funnel cake and call it, call it a day. And it's a great deal, you know? I don't know if they still do that kind of stuff. Probably. Probably. Eh? Anyway. All right, let's talk about fish. Now, we have a lot to talk about because, uh, you know, Michael, your company rebranded, what, two years ago? When you moved a year ago you, as a local coho, when did the rebrand happen? When you went on? No, so um, local coho uh, as a company started probably about uh, five or six years ago now. Um, and... Uh, um, it's just gone through some twists and turns along that way. I joined about two years ago, but they had already established local coho as as the brand right, right. That, that they wanted to have. And in your your Megilla is inland recirculating aquaculture in upstate New York, right? Yeah, that's so, absolutely right. So that's one piece of growing. Uh, I always mention freshwater, also. Just I know we're going to get into it. So that's like, you know, that's one big technology thing. Okay, we'll get into it. And then, but the second big thing, and the, well, I'm super excited to have Safe here, is that uh, you also are practicing the only, well, first of all, the only farmed uh, product that I know of that it, in the United States that is uh, has Ikejime te techniques. And for those of you who don't know, Ikejime writ large are the, is the panoply of fish killing techniques uh, pioneered in Japan to increase the quality of fish flesh uh, as it's consumed uh, by by people uh not only that but maybe the first ai uh, ikijima machine ever the first machine learning that's brain like, spike that's what we like to think yeah, yeah. <laughs> well wait are there, are there other people do you have like cage matches with people no no i mean maybe put the robots you know and get them head to head but we're i mean i like to think we're the only one uh as far as i know in the indu the industrial farms in japan are sitting there with people doing it hand yeah. by hand yeah. you know there's some mechanical culturally that's more like what they're more likely to do right yeah had to be someone not there mm -hmm. i think what yeah. do you think yeah well i think you know uh it's interesting when you compare the food systems right like you know the u.s is i you know i'm immigrant to the u.s right and so i get to also kind of look at things a little bit from outside and i've been both to the u.s and to japan when i was younger and when I'm here in the U.S., the way that I almost see the philosophy around how we grow our food is very top-down, where it's like X number of people, Y number of calories per person equals Z volume production. Whereas in Japan, there's a little bit of a different relationship. I think that is changing in the modern times. But if you go to small pockets like Hokkaido, um, they think of it very bottoms-up, where 
you know, you take these artisanal systems that feed people on an individual basis really effectively, and then how do you scale those, right? And so that's why, you know, Japan, like, Wagyu has the branding it does, right? When the genetics are mixed and, you know, all these other uh, factors around it, really it comes down to the certain philosophy that, you know, um, our food becomes us, that there's this tradition and culture passed down that I think, you know, um, brings these really special um, methods like Ikejime to the, really to the forefront. Um, there are some other alternatives that people are using to try and replicate some of, um, that are not like just automation, carbon monoxide, mm. um, electrical stunning, things like that. I've tried some of those. What do you think? Uh, I had real bad luck with electro stunning, like mm. real bad luck. I spoke to the people who were doing electro stunning on crustaceans. I've tried it some with, I mean, obviously it's a little bit dicey to do it on your own mm-hmm. from a safety standpoint, right. electro stunning. <laughs> uh, it's pretty dangerous, yes. <laughs> uh, and also, this was, you know, 10, 12 years ago. There weren't a lot, I mean, a lot of the research, as far as I can remember, on electro stunning was um, with waveform, um, you know, particular pulse trains where to hit them, but they always cause, like, super damage. So Hematomas. Yeah, so, like, let's, I mean, okay, so let's, I don't know where to start here. I really don't. So uh, I was going to say, how do you get into, like, Ikejime? Like, you must have come from engineering first, Ikejime second, or did you grow up like a fish freak? Like, what, <laughs> like, where did you come, where, how did you come to wanting to apply engineering uh, mm. to Ikejime? But then I think for a lot of our listeners, I mean, a lot of our listeners know about Ikejime, but, like, some of them, probably don't, mm-hmm. right, what the kind of benefits are. Because I think, you know, <clears throat> 10, 12 years ago when I first heard about it from Dave Chang, I thought it was honestly mystical bullcrap until I ran a bunch of tests and, you know, mm-hmm. read, read a lot of papers on it. So I don't know, what, what, we, what should we tackle first in this? How you got into it or what the hell it is? Yeah, we can start from there. And Which? then uh, the uh, uh, origin story. Okay, your origin story. Right, yeah. go for it. Right. Yeah, sure. So, uh, I grew up on the coast my entire life. So, not related to fishing, but you know, I like to say a seafaring family. <laughs> uh, um, born in Canada, but then raised in Saudi Arabia and Jeddah, and then um, the UAE and Dubai, uh, which are you know, actually most people think of Dubai as you know the oil, uh, you know, well actually technically Abu Dhabi, but I think of the UAE as very much like oil driven. But Dubai actually was started as a fishing port, and um, so it's on the coast. What's the main fish there? Um, it depends on which area. You know, actually, if you go and fish off of Fajera, which is on the other side, you can go and get tuna. In Dubai, there's like sherry, which is kind of like a porgy, you know. Um, and then... And what do they eat? A pan, like a sardine? What do they do? Yeah, it's, almost, it's always cooked um, and cooked the same day, uh, you know, or at least a few days after, very rapidly. Like grill? More grill or more like... like a whole pan. Yeah, like yeah, cooked, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they'll normally gut it and then put things inside and then, just, you know, um, serve the entire thing. Um... And then, yeah, you know, my uh, my granddad uh, was, uh, my family's Kashmiri. Uh, my granddad's in Navy, so we actually have matching sailor tattoos. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, yeah, he's the only granddad I ever met, but it was kind of symbolic for that. And then uh, my sister left a scuba dive. So very much like I grew up around water. And the first time I went fishing was with my dad. And so we're sitting in the Red Sea, beautiful, idyllic environment, pull a fish out of the water. And so these, uh, the natural thing for a fisherman to do, throw it in a bucket of ice, close off the top, and don't think about it, right? But... You know, when you go back to the dock and you land two hours later and you open the bucket, the fish is normally still alive, right? And you'll see some blood around the edges and, you know, but you'll see it breathing, really, trying to because the ice will melt or there'll still be some made of water. You know, they're built very different. <laughs> and so I, I was, you know, pretty young at the time, didn't really think too hard about it. But fast forward 20 years, immigrate here to the U.S. by myself. Uh, I went to college uh, where I studied business and physics. And then uh, I went to graduate school for computer science. One of my early mornings there, there was this uh, essay in the newspaper on uh, if fish could scream. It was all about how because fish don't have vocal cords, we give them less empathy than land animals like cattle, poultry, whatever have you. And most pertinent was really like the end of life experience. So the essay by Peter Singer was really about how most fish today suffocate to death when you walk into most mass market retailers. And um, that suffocation process, you know, people think it happens right away uh, where the fish lose consciousness, but in reality, it can take many hours. And so I was talking about that and basically some uh, around that, some of the issues around waste, um, specifically in the wild-caught industry, um, but also around like phenomenology of pain, what does it mean to be, feel pain, experience, things like that. And so I was just thinking about the problem space. On YouTube, uh, I searched up how to kill fish. I found Andrew Choi from the EKGMA Federation who has done a lot of work around EKGMA awareness here in the U.S. 
I sent him a cold email, and if anyone had automated Ikijime, and the rest is history. Hmm. Uh, I think it's hilarious. You're the one of the only people I have met who is like uh, read Singer's work mm-hmm. and been like, "How can I kill these things more effectively?" <laughs> <laughs> Thing. Uh, we uh, so I, I started the Museum of Food and Drink, uh, mm-hmm. and we once did a um, uh, ethics of meat, mm-hmm. and he was. We had him on as one of the panelists. It's so funny. It was him and um, I was the moderator and it was Patrick Martin's from Heritage Food. I forget who the third person was, but oh my God, what a what an odd crew that was. Uh, yeah. Um, all right. So for Ikijime, right, <clears throat> I think what is clear is that the end of life experience for fish anyway, it hasn't been as proven in other animals. And I was really interested, by the way, if you want to get really gruesome about it, mm. I w- have been for a long time interested in, um, in, uh, nitrogen, uh, hypoxia for mammal slaughter. Mm. Uh, they know they do for tuna. And, well, and they, they just did the first human, uh, execution in Alabama with, uh, nitrogen gas. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, uh, not to get horribly gruesome, but I guess we're going to get horribly gruesome on it. The problem with it is that, I mean, like anyone who's done their research knows that in mammals, in mammals, right, uh, uh, excess, ni- like reducing oxygen below uh, life threshold and increasing nitrogen is a painless way to go, except that that's only if you don't know what's happening. So the person that they, and by the way, my personal, you know, whatever, neither here nor there. I just, I don't believe that the state should be in the business of killing people. I'm anti whatever. I just don't believe it's effective, whatever. That's me. Uh, it's not a political show. So I'm just talking about the mechanics of it. Right. But, uh, yeah. So the, the prisoner, you know, attempted to hold his breath. And if you attempt to hold your breath, it's just as horrifying as any other being asphyxiated situation. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, yeah, we tried, uh, we tried, nitrous oxide actually and co2 co2 is the worst fish killing technique i tried they hated it oh yeah they're jumping out of the water yeah yeah yeah. they hate it so like you know i tried i tried that but uh consistently uh brain spike followed in some fish cases by spinal ablation now is that so your 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 robot locates and spikes the brain, right? It uses a computer, like it uses a computer machine learning. It looks at it. It's like brain, no. In fact, your company is called Shinkei Systems, like nerve systems. You're hitting the nerve, taking it out, boom, right? Mm -hmm. Brain, no. So how fast can you, how fast can you spike these things? Uh, We can probably cycle time per fish is around 10 to 15 seconds. And what's normal kill cycle for a fish? If you're going to actually like do it by hand this way, rather than just asphyxiate them or do some sort of horrible... It's probably equivalent, like around 10 seconds. Okay, but it works all the time. Not mm-hmm. how, Like uh, how many mishits do you get on a machine versus a human? So the way that we angled it, um, and again, it'll depend on mishit. This is, this is really getting to the weeds, right? But so there's like the prefrontal cortex for awareness, and then there's motor cortex, right? Which the motor cortex, because of the seizures and tightening the muscles, that's where it affects the quality. So the way that we've angled, um, the way that we spike the brain, with the fish is uh, we prioritize hitting the motor cortex. And ideally, we hit the prefrontal cortex as well. But when you hit the motor cortex, at least the fish is limp. So there's never really a miss hit from an industrial standpoint. But then if you go to a lot of the NGOs, like there's a question around like, hey, is this you know, really more humane? The fish do die much quicker, right? Yeah. You know, Open Philanthropy gave us a, uh, a large grant to study side by side around you know, doing um, EEG scans with the fish um, and understanding this. And that's actually how we came to this conclusion around motor versus prefrontal, right? And um, so we prioritize the motor, but then again, if we want to be pushing for the best standard for more humane um, and like phenomenological experience for the fish, then you know, probably need like a, you know, a very big spike. You know, they're, the fish brains are pretty small, but, you know, between the cortexes, there's like, you know, a good amount of distance that if you have a very thin spike, it can often be difficult to hit both. So you don't Could use, you use you two don't, spikes? You don't use one of those That's curve, yeah. you don't use one of those curve, like, uh, ones where they like go scimitar. in and just, yeah, like, you know, those little mini scimitars that they... <laughs> no, I've not yeah, seen those, no. Yeah, yeah, the hand, well, some of the hand brain spike ones, because they just go in and around like this, because mm-hmm. they don't want to think about it, I guess. I used to work on a, on, a, on a pot fishing boat, very briefly, and we used to take a bat and then put a nail at the end of the bat. Oof. And then we just... 
You ever seen the Simpsons episode where uh, Bart and the whole family is trapped in Japan for some reason? They do something terrible and they can't get back to the United States, and so they end up working as fish killing people in a, <laughs> in a in a in a large fish plant, and like just like like saying that style, like just dumps on them, and then Bart Simpson just goes, knife goes in, guts come out, knife goes in, guts come out. You ever seen this? <laughs> knife goes in, guts come out, and then he picks up a fish and it goes. I will grant you three wishes. If knife goes in, guts come out. He just keeps going. It's the best. You got to watch it. If, you're, that, if yeah. you're a professional fish killer, you got to I know. Go, this yeah. is like the first time hearing about it. I got to yeah, see that. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, I think, uh, you know, it's, I don't know if the science has progressed a lot since uh, I looked at it all, but um, it's pretty clear that um, in fish especially, uh, they go through a much harder rigor mortis if uh, there's a lot of stress uh, towards the end of their, well, when they're being slaughtered and immediately pre-slaughter if they're freaked out. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the faster they deplete the ATP and go into rigor, the harder the rigor mortis is and the harder the rigor mortis is, the more gaping. So a few people have ever bought a salmon and there's like big gaping holes in the fillet, that sucker went through hard rigor, right? Or it was just butchered incredibly poorly, but most likely it went through hard rigor. And so like these Ikijimi processes are about reducing muscle movement and loss of ATP around uh, peri-slaughter time and post-slaughter. And so uh, they dramatically increase the flesh quality of meat. So uh, we'll go to the salmon one. That's the salmon side by Most side. Most people won't be able to see it. So you're going to have okay. to tell people what they're seeing. Sure. So, well, uh, I'll flip this around for you so you can see as well. But this is like a normal side-by-side Ikijime uh, versus uh, asphyxiation. This is on wild porgy. And you'll see here, uh, relative to that, if you zoom in on the left, uh, what we're looking at right now, this big red fillet, meat gaping in the meat. And then on the right, you have a really like, um, rigid meat texture six days later, right? And so you can really see a pretty big difference, especially as the time compounds. Um, do you want to go through the salmon or should we... Uh... Well, there, yeah, so like only a few people are going to be able to see the image. Oh, so sure, you're going to sure. have to talk through it quick. But okay. if you notice in this thing, I'm assuming the one that was asphyxiated when I was doing it, and I'm assuming this here is like a lot redder because they get almost a uh, blood vessel bursts exactly. and a, a lot of, I mean, it's not, you know, it's not uh, physiologically okay to die that way. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a gen there's a, a definite, I would say almost 100% across the board, every test I've ever run, there's a definite difference between zero intervention, i.e. asphyxiation, and uh, proper ekijime. But even between head bludgeoning and mm -hmm. ekijime, there's a, a big difference. Right. Um, have you done any tests of of uh, brain spike versus just, I know that you haven't automated it yet, but uh, versus spinal ablation? I don't know. All the spinal ablation studies that I know are in larger fish like tuna, although mm -hmm. all of my personal tests on spinal ablation are with things like fluke and, um, yeah. and bass. So we... What we've already seen is there's such a huge difference with doing the brain spike and the gill cut and the tail cut to really, you know, stop the experience of stress as well as like bleeding the meat. The spinal ablation really compounds all those benefits. So, for example, with the fluke fish you mentioned, um, I think we have a photo for, for the those... Um, Again, I know it's a podcast. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but um, but we, so, you know, pe people can look on it. So people are like, we're going to put the slides up and people can look at them. But go on. I don't know where you go on, actually, John. Where do they go on to look at things uh, for our podcast? Well, patreon.com slash cooking issues. There you go. Yeah. All right, yeah, yeah. yeah. So now for this, we'll, uh, you know, it's be on the videos, but maybe we can get Quinn to post it. On the socials? Up, yeah. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, so, I mean, long and short of it, um, this is the photo, but basically you can see this is just with EKG main, and the other one is with Shinke G main, and so what you'll see is basically you're compounding the time for rigor, so... With fluke, for example, if you suffocate it, it'll go into rigor almost the same day or you know, 24 hours. With, if you EKG may, so spike the brain, cut the gills, op often cut, open the tail as well, you know, the heart pumps up both ends. You can hit into, go into peak rigor around three days later. And then if you do the spinal ablation, that'll be a full week later. So again, it's just compounding the benefits. But we've already seen relative to suffocation, electrocution, um, we're able to really get a uh, pretty substantial difference for industry. And obviously, the spinal ablation is probably the hardest problem around, you know, EKG may. So EKG may is like a four-part technique, right? They're collectively known as EKG may, but we actually, you know, at Shinke, we think of um, the spinal ablation as like almost, you know, you know the fourth step, uh, almost a separate technique. So the first three are spike the brain, cut the gills, cut the tail, right? Spike the brain to stop any experience of stress, release cortisol, things like that. You cut the gills, cut the tail to open the bo both ends of the major artery around the fish. The heart, which is still active after brain death, will pump the blood out naturally. And so in turn, you know, when you remove the blood, 
So there's, uh, well, if you spike the brain, so there's no experience of stress, there's no release in like cortisol and adrenaline, like analogs, right? And so you have a less acidic environment, you know, lactic acid also production goes down. So you have a less acidic environment. When you have a less acidic environment, um, bacteria that, uh, fewer bacteria grow or they grow slowly. And then when you remove the blood, you know, oftentimes the bacteria will use that blood as nutrition. And so, you, you know, by removing the blood, you starve them out. And so what happens is, you know, um, instead of suffocating the meat actually, or uh, rotting and spoiling, the meat actually begins to dry age. I think dry aging is not quite though, like one to one. I actually almost akin, uh, put it akin to like fruit ripening. Yeah. You know, I don't really know. I know it's a huge thing now, but I I've never been to one of these places that actually age the fish and the yeah, yeah and the humidity controlled fridges. Those are great. You know, actually for the folk that are in LA, there's a great spot called the Joint where you can just go in and you know retail some dry aged fish, and it's really phenomenal. Yeah. Um, but those are where they hang the fish in a humidity controlled fridge uh, in the a fridge for a few days. In this context, it's a little more like ripening, where you're extending the time to peak ripeness, and then you know, obviously, the quality after it hits ripe, ripe uh, the full ripening capacity is. There. Yes. So I think it's another thing that I mean, probably our listeners know about, but a lot of people don't. People think of a fresh, fresh, fresh. No, no, right, correct. You know, not not uh, not the freshest fish, the correct time fish. You know what I mean? The one right. that's you know gone through rigor, and there's a definite. There's a definite like you know, if you eat a fish that's. I mean, some cultures love fish that was killed right away. We don't. I don't. You know what I mean? Like, I don't. Do you like crunchy, super fresh fish? Like, I mean, it's a thing. I I have enjoyed it, but it's not the choice I would typically make mm -hmm. for most of the fish species that that I would eat. So, um, yeah. So this peak period. I, now again, I don't know anything about this dry. I don't know about this like super extended stuff that that people are doing now. Mm -hmm. Although I did run a test once on um. You know. You know. I heard of uh, Randall FX fridges. Unified brands. So they were one of the first people to come out with a, a, a very low airflow, uh, like almost like cooler style fridge mm -hmm. that you opened up. And we we just would put uh, crush ice down and fish, and they kept for phenomenal lengths of time because it just wasn't a lot of drying out. Um, mm -hmm. It's kind of mimicking like what, uh, you know, some of the old school. You ever dealt with like the sushi chefs who will unplug all of the fridges and just put blocks of ice in it and like put their fish in it? Oh, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that makes sense to me. Yeah. Um, I do think my POV is oftentimes for for fish, ice can be a good crux for, uh, or poor, uh, poor, uh, poor, poor crutch for for fish. The ideal environment is you have a humidity controlled, low temperature, like 28 to 36 Fahrenheit fridge if you want to keep them fresh. Um, the problem with if you have very aggressive um, icing is you can start to get some like iced burns on the meat, the ice melts, that water in between the scales will sit, and then, you know, still water becomes a cesspool, the bacteria will grow. And so that's yeah. oftentimes where you get a lot of that, you know, off flavors and smells around uh, very fishy environments. So what's the ideal number of days for an EKG May salmon? What's the, what's the best day to eat one post-slaughter? What do you think, Michael? Uh, that's a good question. Um, those are the tests we used to run. We would just do yeah. a bunch, and then we would eat a little every day. You know what I mean? And yeah, like, uh, I have not. Done, we've done uh, certainly visual and, and texture mm -hmm. trials. Uh, easier to quantify day by mm -hmm. day, but um, like palatability. Do you have like? Do you have? A, I, I would. I can only guess, but it's not day one. That's for sure. Yeah, I think yeah, it's, when, that, it's like probably. I don't know. I'd say like day four, probably. Uh, do, yeah. do you do the test? Do you do the two the two push test? Do the push, do push your finger down. And, no, and oh, well, with the machine? Do you have the machine? Oh, we have the machine. No, oh, no, yeah. no. Uh, <laughs> There's I was, a machine that can measure the impedance, you know, and oh, that, yeah, that's yeah. Like supposed to be a good proxy for it. Um, when we were doing the studies, I think we were looking at, you know, with suffocation, uh, um, which is not what Michael originally was doing. They're doing like a kind of con like a gill pull, which is very common and standard. Um, but when we looked at suffocation, you know, that'd be three to four days is like kind of the right amount of time to eat it. Um, when you EKG me it, that time can be around like eight to nine days. Um, but really, when when you pull up to one of the dis distributors that are carrying local coho fish, that's serving many many Mission Star restaurants, uh, as I've done, trying to get feedback on how the robot's working. They'll say they have an, a full extra day, with, a, a full extra week with the fish, uh, which for them can be very substantial given that they're taking so much logistics and distribution risk, uh, given the fish is so perishable. So, so um, you get it to them right before the peak of the hump and they get to ride that little, yeah. that little zone. Mm -hmm. And, the, and, and the, the distribution curve of 
peak ripeness mm -hmm. is a, is a wider, fl flatter curve, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas, so rather than having a narrow window, like, oh, you got to eat it now if you really want to experience it the best. It's you know, it's yeah. it's uh, delayed, so you have you have a, a bigger window in which to enjoy it, peak ripeness. All right, so let's talk coho for one second. So what's another thing I think is interesting is that a lot of like, for instance, where I used to work at Ora King back when they used to do. Uh, uh, anesthesia, which by the way also yeah. makes it you gotta guys gotta. I'm telling you, what if you just used uh clove oil but didn't call it anesthesia? Could you do it? I think I, I, I'm not sure. I, you mentioned that before, and yeah. I, th I think I started to poke around. It's, su I, I it's, super, what I found. it's super easy yeah. to make the emulsion, you don't need to buy acquiesce, you know right, what I mean? Right. You can just, you know, do they even still sell acquiesce out of New Zealand uh, and Australia? Uh, they might, they might. I'm not sure. Stuff works great, yeah. You know what I mean? And you can make your own. I used to do it all the time. I'll go to Whole Foods, buy clove oil, you know, uh, you know, do my little marathon man speech, and then, uh, you know, anesthetize uh, the fish. Works great. Yeah, I think you and I talked about this. Like, if you listed it, as, just listed it as an ingredient, you know, yeah. clove oil. It's, it's grass as an yeah. ingredient, yeah. just not as a medicine. It's bizarre. We have the mm -hmm. weirdest rules. I'm telling you, man. And you also, I know you like the flavor. There is, by the way, people slight flavor of clove but it's good yeah it tastes yeah. good yeah yeah people like it was it. very appealing and, and yeah and distinctive yeah yeah <laughs> just a little in the little Bring in the background back. i you need to have your lawyers look at whether you can do it as long as you don't call it anesthesia don't make any claims if you don't claim that it's anesthesia if you don't make a benefit claim that you're performing anesthesia then and it's not that expensive right i mean i don't know how how it would fit into the um You'd have to, I don't know what your pre-slaughter tanks are like, but you know what I mean? It's like, uh, I don't know. Yeah, it's the rules you'd have to, but it definitely makes a difference. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. And you could be the only people doing that too. <laughs> and it does actually increase welfare, for sure. I mean, I can't prove it because you can't prove what a fish thinks, but they're, you know, they act much more mellow. They're like... Yeah. Visually, it's like they're just everything's okay, dude. Yeah. <laughs> you, like we're all good here. You you so when you pick up a fish and you're gonna do the spike on it, right? You're gonna do the kill and the spike. Like you you have to be like pretty like you have to be calm and assertive, otherwise the fish is gonna freak out, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Say yeah, you, yeah. you're telling me, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> so you need to have a certain sort of mindset as the fish killer. And still, you're gonna have some times when you mess up, especially like the worst we did uh we did uh Tautog, black black mm -hmm. oh my god. Like, oh my god. Like it was nightmare. A fish, though. Yeah, 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 but not fun to try to, yeah. <laughs> anyway, if you're a, a worthless person like myself and don't do it every day, you know what I mean? That mm -hmm. takes a lot of skill. Yeah. Anywho, uh, but when they're on when they're on that clove oil, man, they're just like, all right, mm -hmm. okay. You never lose a clove oil fish off the table. It does not happen. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Maybe make it easier for a computer to hit, although it sounds like your computer can hit it pretty good. Like what? Oh, you ever say what's your miss rate? What is it like compared to a person? Much better, I'm sure. Well, well so the the premise I was uh, talking about, where if we miss, it would go a little too far back, and then it would hit the motor cortex, uh, and then because of that, basically, you, you still kind of get the be the the quality benefits. So right. we don't really experience um, any misses. However, I will say uh, the robot does break. <laughs> when, uh, particularly in startup when it's like calibrating um, that uh, especially earlier on when we first deployed it now we, we kind of have things rocking and rolling where you know, we can do hundreds of fish an hour but do you have a two hands free so that your hand doesn't get spiked? well as long as actually it's <laughs> <laughs> it's like a it's almost, almost like, a, like a big box yeah. and then it's, uh, the important thing right now is you put the fish in head first um, any orientation and then the fixed string system we designed is kind of like you know size agnostic and so it's agnostic so it kind of wraps around the animal the um, but it like it closes in almost like like a custom sluice. Yeah, like a, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Right. <laughs> no, no one can see my hands, but you can We're kind of like suctioning around the fish. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. And uh, it's great. It's gravity fed. And gravity fed as well. Yeah, yes. it's gravity Sweet. fed from a a funnel basically, and then it reaches its um, ikijime point. Right. And yeah, there's a nose plate that stops it. Now your original mm -hmm. one was on a was actually on a boat, which seems like a bigger pain in the butt. But they probably don't require you to have as fast a throughput as you would on land, right? Yeah, very very different robot. That was like a you know six by six feet um, tall, kind of like a three D printer, which was the original idea I mocked up in my dorm room, but with a water jet. And so the theory why we wanted to use a water jet was you know you can use salt water, which 
really, you know, you can't because, you know, metals corrode and piping and things like that. Yeah, you used so, aluminum. Yeah. Salt water, really rough yeah. on that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, we could, have, we could have made it with stainless steel, which would have been better, but even that has a shelf life yeah. to it too. So, um, uh, and then the fixturing system was much more manual than it was today. So we reverted back to um, uh, a mechanical-based system, which we've had much more success with. You know. shoom, shoom, shoom. How, how often do you have to replace that? I mean, is this bike pretty much a, a lifetime Megilla? I mean, like- I have, uh, probably about a month of operations. Then you, yeah. yeah, but we, we leave um, you know, all the items for Michael's team. We've got replacement yeah. bikes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice. Uh, so uh, another uh, thing I thought was interesting about this is that, you know, for those of you that don't know, Coho is a relatively small salmon, right? And mm-hmm. so usually, like, um, these techniques... In, when they're done industrially or, or commercially, are done on larger high-value fish where there's less, you know, a, a single operation is over a larger quantity of fish, mm-hmm. meat. Uh, and so it's, you know, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, at whatever they call it, Sakiji now, like they're doing, you know, these techniques on smaller fish constantly, mm-hmm. but not on a commercial slash industrial scale. So it's interesting that you're bringing it Using the uh, the automation allows you to bring it to a smaller fish species than, let's say, tuna or one of the larger salmon. Well, the end goal for the robot is we're about three something seconds uh, per fish in the in one lane, and then of course the multi lane system. So the intention is that we have many lanes, each one running about a thousand fish an hour. So then you can just stack them all together if they're modular, and in turn you, know, you can really reach those industrial throughputs because two fifty is you know I think okay. Uh, manageable for, you know, medium size, maybe smaller farm. But when you're going to like, you know, these guys are doing like hundreds of millions of fish, you know, every year. It's um, for that, you do need like faster throughput. Mm-hmm. So this like, is one reason we've been, Shinke and local coho has mm-hmm. been a good partnership, partnership. is mm-hmm. we're both the right size for each other. Yeah, we're both the right size. Yeah, we're both, <laughs> exactly. you know, young, small uh, 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 startup companies. Uh-huh. Uh, we're not harvesting, you know, millions or even thousands of fish every week. It's a pretty small number. Um, uh, we deployed their 2.0, uh, Shinke system and they're working on their 4.0. So it's like, we're kind of, what we'll happened to three? Kind of growing, kind of growing together. Three. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Spike goes in, brain comes out. Spike <laughs> goes in, brain comes out. All right. Uh, Michael, I think most of these questions are, are for you. So Jacob P writes in, um, I think, uh, RAS, which is recirculating, uh, aquaculture system, uh, systems are an important piece of fixing the largely unsustainable seafood industry. Here are my questions, uh, for Michael and safe. Why focus on coho over other species such as, uh, Chinook slash King, sockeye or rainbow trout one, uh, and since you are focusing on a recirculation, have you looked at integrating this with hydroponics to create an aquaponic system to take advantage of the full nitrogen cycle? And I guess the answer is, what do you do with all your extra nitrogen? I'm assuming you have biofilters coming out of your, your ears. Um, and uh, are you able, and I'm curious about this, to share your feed conversion ratio uh, off, uh, off of what you, like, you know, for, for those of you who don't know, mm-hmm. like classic, like, People think people want to know is inputs versus outputs. One of the mm-hmm. main inputs is food. Obviously, there's other inputs in a recirculating system mm-hmm. like uh, electricity and all these other things. But you want to take a take some brain stabs at these. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so the first one was species choice, I think, right? Yeah. So uh, we chose coho for a few different reasons. Uh, one, it's a salmon that does well in fresh water, so that is important. We wanted a species that thrived or, you know, it can live a, a healthy, full life cycle in fresh water. Kings also do well in fresh water, by the way. Um, I know some of the old auras were all fresh, right? And some Yeah, were like you've heard, you've heard of the tai, or yeah. king tai, which is like their... Um, big, you know, big old. Su- super luxury, you know, 30-pound uh, plus salmon. Those are all grown in fresh water. Uh, so, uh, so certain salmon do well in fresh water. Cohos do well. Uh, cohos also have a relatively, um, compared to some other salmon, quicker life cycle. But how old's how old's a harvested? Uh, it should be about eighteen months versus you know up to say thirty six for an Atlantic salmon, and uh, I kind of forget what the Orca kings. I think they were about thirty months. So eighteen, you know, that's a shorter life cycle. So there's some like kind of commercial and economic benefits to that. Um, uh, uh, and they taste good. Like cohos are well respected salmon. There's basically three, I consider three premium Pacific 
species that people really seem to like, kings, sockeyes, and cohos. Uh, we, we definitely wanted to avoid the Atlantic salmon as a species because that's really the, the, the commodity player yeah. in the salmon market. It's not really the fish's fault, though. It's not the fish's fault. You're right. Um, but we, you know, we're trying to be a little more of a... Um, what about chum? It's more, got such a bad name. No one's going to eat chum. It's, yeah, they got a name problem. <laughs> you know, the old CEO at uh, New Zealand King Salmon, he used to like, he'd be like, thank God it's called King. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, It's like my marketing is done for me. Yeah. <laughs> and what are you eating? Chum. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Yeah, so, all right. Um, so that, okay, so that was species. And then... Uh, what was the next one? Uh, it was, uh, have you looked into integrating hydroponics, growing other things like oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. plants and whatnot to, to fix the nitrogen and use it for a se- second, second source of income? Yeah, uh, we have not. It, it does exist. It's, it's really two separate businesses, and, mm-hmm. and it's hard to align scales um, because you need, like, you know— um, uh, you have a, hu- a huge, uh, say, lettuce production for a small salmon production. It's hard to align scales. You need the right amount of lettuce for the right amount of salmon. What are you going to do? That, that's right, yeah. You know? um, what are you going to do? Uh, so it, it's a John much- needs to serve a salad and a salmon. Be like, oh, sorry, no salad today. <laughs> that's right. You, you know got, what I mean? Everyone has to eat 10 pounds of sa- uh, lettuce for yeah, yeah, uh, two yeah. ounces of salmon. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is that what it is? Is that, is that the- I, I, don't, I don't know if that's the exact ratio, but it... it Michael Fabro said. <laughs> um, <laughs> Didn't a farm in Brooklyn try this out? Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a successful one, small, again, small, because this is a young, nascent industry, this RAS industry, but there's one in Was Wisconsin. Is that how they call it in the biz, RAS? Yeah, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah, right. So, yeah. Uh, um, there's one in Wisconsin. Uh, they're called Superior Fresh. Yeah. Are they? Uh, <laughs> I'm just fresh or superior. Either. I don't know. I don't know these. I've, act- uh, I've not tried their salmon yet. Actually. All right. All right. Um, Got to try the competitors. Don't be like these pizza people that don't eat other people's pizza. Oh, I, I, I love people. trying. I love right. doing side by side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. Yeah. Um, but they're doing pretty well, and and um, they've been around a while. Um, uh, but it's it's a very it's a much more complicated business, a lot much more capital intensive. It's already a capital intensive business to start with. Right, requires a lot of you know a lot of money up front. Um, yeah. So we just you know, we wanted to focus on the the salmon or the fish side of it. Um, right. But in, in, in far as capturing effluent or right. fish waste, we're not quite at the stage yet. When when we build our larger farm, uh, there's going to be some more bells and whistles. And one thing we will do is build in the capacity to capture the fish waste. Um, uh, and then that becomes, it's it's a ready-to-go organic fertilizer. Yeah, I mean, it's just nitrogen, up, nitrogen, nitrogen, nitrogen yeah. stuff. Yeah, and I'm like we're, on, in, yeah, we're in the yeah. farm country up in central New York, right. like— there's a home for all this, yeah. Yeah, I think most of those uh, double systems of plants like are most successful on cottage scale kind of situations, like someone doing it for them, like for small communities and for themselves, right? Not on an industrial level, or I, I, it seems to be at least so, so far, far. You know, maybe twenty years from now, it'll be a different story. Someone will, someone will figure it out. Now, your feed conversion ratio. Are you willing to talk about it? Yeah, uh, I will, but I, I'm gonna. And what percentage of the food is fish based food, like fish meal, fish oil? Right. Well, that's what I want to talk more about fish in, fish out. Fish in, fish out. I love it. It's fi- It's the new FIFO, people. It's, it's the new FIFO. For you accountants, this is the, the more fun version of FIFO. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, feed conversion ratio is just how many pounds of feed do you feed a salmon over its lifetime to get a, a pound uh, of harvested fish? And it doesn't ever consider, like, well, what's in the feed? It's, it's just pounds of feed. Um, so it's it's an int- it's an important metric for the producer, particularly because it has commercial implications. Like, you know, yeah, and a lot of sustainability people are worried about growing one plant to feed if if it's not fish based, if it's plant based, right? They're interested in like, you know, why are you growing a billion pounds of whatever to make a cow, right? So yeah. they do care about non fish based inputs, but I think in your business, fish inputs are the big. Whoop- That's the big one, right? So like, you know, if you're gonna farm fish. You, you know, gotta kill, it seems, gotta kill fish to grow it fish. It seems kind of counterintuitive if you're going to grow 10 pounds of fish to go use 100 pounds of wild fish. Right. Right. So, what's the number? Because I only have two minutes left. They're going to rip Our number is zero. 
You zero fish? Zero. Right. So where are you getting the oils from? Because they don't make their own. Like, uh, what do you algae feed? oil. Algae oil. Algae oil. Yeah. And who's growing the algae oil? Uh, Vera Maris. Nice. So so zero. And then so how many pounds of stuff does it take? Just so people know, is it like? Is it like I know like chickens like under two? Is it like twenty or is it? Oh, like, FCR. Yeah. Uh, you know, we haven't hit we haven't hit our target growth curve yet. So we're supposed to grow them in eighteen months. It's been taking longer. So our FCRs are kind of out of whack. Right. Like we want. But what should it be? What's it the should, target? Ah, uh, geez. It, I think it's like one point five. Oh, good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, a lot of people are worried about the one of the things people worry about is uh, inputs of things like electricity and whatnot. Um, you're, you're recirculating the water, but. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming there's ways to ameliorate that, but before we go, I want to talk about geosmin and uh, other taint stuff. How do you prevent that stuff from getting into your systems and putting taint in? And also, because we're going to rip me off the air here, is that freshwater versus salt water with the free amino acids in the fish getting the flavor profile, have you ever considered going brackish, or is it just technologically too difficult to do a recirculating inland brackish uh, system? Yeah, a lot of questions. Uh off flavors like geosmin, um, it exists in recirculating freshwater systems. You need to have a finishing stage. Yeah. So we have a finishing pool or finishing tank where the fish will live for a week. They'll go off feed. And then we have some technology that basically um, uh, through oxidation is yeah. killing. I hear you can ozone the hell out of the, the water as it goes through, right? Yeah, yeah. And so that's removing the geosmin and the 2 MIB. Yeah. Um, methyl, what is it? Methyl iso. Uh, I had to write it down. Something. Uh, methyl iso. I forget. Something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, MIB, yeah. So that, and that, and that works. Like, uh, the fish quality is really good. You don't get any off flavors if you do this well. You, and, and you get, you know, uh, c clean, mild, uh, but also savory. Yeah. What about what about uh, what about brackish? Is no one do, no one's going to do br brackish? Uh, too complicated. I, I think it would be difficult. It, yeah. It sounds like it's complicated from uh, water filtration and, and maintaining fish appetite. Um, because we find that the more clean and pure and less particles are in the water, the fish eat better. Mm. Um, and again, you want them to eat because you want them to grow. Um, uh, do you hand feed or do you have some sort of computer to make sure that they're eating all the crap? Uh, it's we have a little, there's a little like um, I thought a picture of someone going whoof and throwing some food in. Uh, so that's like for a show and tell. Hey, look at you know, <laughs> yeah. look at the fish. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty automated, right? Come, they'll come to the surface and they'll eat. But yeah, it's automated. There's um, feeders above each uh, tank and it's on a uh, timer and you kind of adjust. You're always adjusting, you know, um, to try to get the right feed and match their appetite levels. Uh, seasonality is another thing that impacts feed. All right, well, listen, we're going to put some of these things up on our socials. Uh, Michael Fabro and uh, Safe Kawaja, thanks for coming on and talking about killing fish and growing fish uh, and the new movement towards RAS aquaculture, which uh, right. we appreciate. Obviously, there's more to talk about. Maybe we'll have you back sometime. Uh, on the way out, do I have two seconds, uh, Joe? Quick. All right. Kevin McHugh wants to know, is there a way to deacidulate a juice so as to make a lemon thing with no acid? You can get very, very mild uh, sodium hydroxide lye solutions. You can pre-buy them to known molarities. And maybe Quinn can put a, I'll put a calculator for you of how much to add to X amount of lemon juice to neutralize it. But let me tell you in advance, it tastes bad. When you neutralize wines, they taste terrible. When you neutralize juice, they taste real bad. Thanks for coming on, guys. Thank you for having us. Yeah, Thanks a lot. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. yeah.